To quickly introduce myself, my name's Andrew Orbinson. I'm a market analyst at IHS Market. Um, I've been with the company around five years now, um, tracking various industrial automation product markets. Um, my latest focus is the motor drives and motors market. So I'd like to share with you today some insights based on the motors market um, from our latest research. We've obviously been tracking the motors market for quite some time now. Um, so we've got a good feel for what's happened in the, in the various markets um, in the past, but also some good insight into what's going to happen uh, in the markets going forwards. So I'd like to present to you some of our latest findings. Um, just a bit of housekeeping before I do start. Um, if you do have any questions for me at all uh, during the presentation, I just ask that you wait until the end. Uh, I will be holding a Q&A afterwards, so uh, uh, I'd be happy to answer your questions at that point. So just quickly to run through the agenda for today. Um, so first of all, I'll start with providing an economic update. Um, so I'll be reviewing what's happened in the economy in the past few years, what's going to happen going forwards. Uh, I'll then move on to providing some key information on the motors market specifically, um, such as key statistics, market sizing, what's the forecast over the next few years, um, as well as some of the key trends that are happening in the market. Just before I wrap up, I'll also uh, be answering the question, what do machine users look for today? Um, we recently conducted a survey to ask this question, um, so I'll be presenting some of the results from that survey a bit later on. Okay, one more thing just before I really start uh, into the main part of the presentation. Um, just to introdu introduce IHS Market for those who aren't aware of who we are. Um, so IHS Market is a leading provider of uh, analytics and information to a wide range of industry sectors. Um, we have different divisions of the company that are focused on different areas. So for example, we have IHS Market Energy, which is uh, focused on things such as oil and gas, uh, power generation sectors. Uh, we also have uh, the transportation group, which focuses on areas such as uh, the automotive industry. But then we have a technology segment as well. So uh, we saw that the global economy grew by around 2.5% in 2016 last year, um, and that was up from 2015 as well. Um, this year we're expecting it to grow to 2.9%, um, so that's in 2017. So what's really driving that? Well, we see the US economy as one of the key drivers, but then also um, commodity exporting regions as well. To give you an example, um, Russia and also Brazil, the key commodity exporting regions, we're expecting those two countries to recover uh, in 2017, and that's primarily driven by commodity prices. We're expecting those to pick up. Um, we've seen recovery through 2016. Uh, they have been low for a period of time, uh, but we are seeing recovery, and we're expecting growth through 2017 uh, going forwards. The US, we're expecting increased capital spending um, and also reduced tax rates from 2018, which will further boost the economy. Um, so with that, the US dollar, we're expecting that in the short term to strengthen against most other major currencies. So elsewhere, looking at Europe, um, there's been some uncertainty in Europe for quite some time now, um, and we're not expecting that really to change. Um, we're expecting uncertainty to continue going forwards, um, particularly uh, due to political environments. So there's been a number of key general elections um, this year and a couple coming up as well, they're expecting. And with those kind of situations, it just causes uh, further uncertainty, um, which adds to risk of, of an economy. Um, just to talk a bit about uh, Brexit. Um, so before the recent UK general election, we weren't expecting that Brexit would have much of a, an impact on the, the UK economy. Uh, however, after the unexpected result of the recent UK general election, um, that's, cha that's changing. So there's different strategies, different approaches in mind towards Brexit, um, and that increased uncertainty is an increased risk. Elsewhere in the Eurozone, um, I've mentioned the political issues that are, are causing uncertainty, but then also there's issues uh, within the banking sector as well that's um, posing a threat to the growth of the, of the uh, Eurozone there. 
I should also mention China. Um, so growth in China, it has been slowing in recent years. Uh, we're not in the tens, the, the, the 11% growth anymore. Um, it has been slowing, um, and we're expecting that to continue. Whilst China will benefit, um, as some of the other regions, from the increasing commodity prices, we're expecting that to be offset um, by market imbalances in credit, housing, as well as industrial markets. So this slide really illustrates um, the economic outlook by region. Um, just to explain it a bit, I know there's a lot of colours going on. So um, in 2016, that's represented by the darker blue line, uh, darker blue bar, and then each different year is represented by a different colour. And you can see the different regions across the bottom of the slide there. Um, so the one bar that probably sticks out to most of you is the blue bar pointing downwards, um, indicating uh, negative GDP growth uh, for 2016, and that was for the other Americas region. Uh, that was largely driven by uh, the Brazilian economy, so it's been struggling economically in, in recent years, uh, including 2016, uh, but also politically with the Petrobras uh, scandal also playing a part there. However, as you can see going forward, there is a, a strong upward trajectory there uh, for 2017 through 2018 and, and onwards. Um, and as I've mentioned, that's going to be driven primarily by commodity prices increasing. The commodity prices will also have a positive impact on some of the other commodity exporting regions. So you can see uh, the Middle East and Africa, positive uh, trajectory going forwards, as well as sub-Saharan Africa, um, and emerging Europe, which would include Russia. Um, another positive uh, region for growth is North America's. Um, it's a different growth profile, however. You can see that it's the, it's the one furthest to the left of the screen. Um, you can see that it peaks in 2018, which is the yellow bar, before growth slows down. Now that's primarily due to um, the 2018 tax cuts that I mentioned um, a little bit earlier which is going to drive that much more investment in 2018 um, and have that much more of a positive impact that year before growth then slows. Um, elsewhere though, you can see uh, within Western Europe, Japan, uh, the rest of Asia Pacific, the growth is going to remain relatively flat over the period. Um, as each bar is a very similar height going forwards, that indicates um, relatively even growth over the forecast period. Now, within uh, Western Europe and Japan specifically, we are expecting exchange, uh, interest rates to remain low. Uh, they have been uh, low for a period of time now, but we're expecting that to continue going forward uh, as governments and central banks aim to increase investment and, and help boost the economy. Within Western Europe specifically, uh, we are expecting that there are going to be continued monetary stimulus to help further boost the economy also. Now, in contrast, in North America, for example, interest rates in the US have been low. But we're expecting those to pick up going forwards as the economy performs that much better. OK, so moving on to machinery production. Um, this slide shows the growth profiles of machinery production. Um, and the growth is in US dollars. So um, that's worth bearing in mind, and I'll touch on that a bit later. Um, but this shows the growth profiles for machinery production uh, from 2013 through to 2021. Now the middle table there and the associated um, figure towards the right, that represents each of the major regions. So we see Americas, Europe and Asia Pacific. Um, now the story is fairly similar in each region in that um, machinery production growth uh, actually declined in 2015 uh, and further in 2016. Before, in 2017, we're expecting a slow recovery um, and the recovery to continue through to 2021. Uh, hopefully you can make that out from the figures on the right-hand side where um, the growth profile crosses the horizontal axes around 2017 and uh, is staying low to a gradual recovery going forward. Um, looking at some of the major regions then, so if you look at the table at the top, and the associated figure, um, you can see that uh, the US and Japan, they generally followed the same profile as some of the major regions. So declining in 2015 and 16 before slowly recovering from 2017. 
Um, it's worth pointing out that Germany and China are slightly ahead of that curve. So in 2016, those countries actually registered positive growth in terms of machinery production, um, albeit very low at 0.4% in both of those countries. Uh, however, it is that they were slightly ahead of that curve. They're also forecast to continue to grow going forwards. Um, now, I mentioned earlier uh, that this is shown in US dollars. Now, the, the table at the bottom is really to highlight the importance of considering exchange rate fluctuations when looking at these numbers. Um, in 2015, for example, the euro uh, depreciated considerably against the US dollar, uh, and that's shown from uh, the growth percentage in 2015 for Europe shown at the bottom. I don't know if you can make that out, but um, in US dollars, uh, machinery production growth declined by 21%, um, whereas in euros it actually declined by just 6%. So that shows that growth profiles can swing considerably depending on exchange rates, so that's worth, it, worth keeping in mind when considering these numbers. Okay, so this slide um, is to review key industry sector weight and performance in 2016 in terms of investment in industrial automation. Um, so looking at the market for industrial automation, you can see that in 2016 there was a fairly even spread of investment across the industry sectors. Um, the largest being infrastructure there, followed by power generation at 7.5%, food and beverage uh, over towards the left, and oil and gas at 6%. Um, now, we'd expect oil and gas to be um, a fair bit higher in previous years, in, in typical years, if you want to call it that. Um, however, that, that market has obviously suffered from uh, low oil prices since 2014, um, impacting mostly in 2015 and 2016, which has caused a, a reduction in that percentage there. But if you do look at the, the lines, now they represent um, the growth profiles of these sectors. So the orange line shows growth in 2016, the blue one shows growth in 2017. Now as you can see across the board really, the blue line is that much higher for all sectors um, than the orange line, which indicates that we're expecting growth to pick up that much more in 2017. Um, which is obviously a positive thing for industrial automation, um, and the motors market is a part of that. Um, it's important to note that uh, some of the industry sectors towards the left of the screen, those are the more discrete industry sectors, um, which have been less affected by commodity prices we've seen, um, and you can see that from the growth um, lines being that much higher. You then see a, a bit of a dip, the U-shape there, um, and that's related to the growth profiles of metals and mining, oil and gas, and power generation, which have been that much more affected um, by commodity prices, uh, the process industries we see being hurt more. Um, that said, uh, we are expecting growth across all sectors going forwards, uh, further out from 2017. It's also important to note that this is a representation of the global market. Um, so there are different regional factors that play a part into these numbers. Um, for example, power generation, which is larger in Asia Pacific. Uh, different economic trends in Asia Pacific are gonna have a, a bit more of an impact on that than in EMEA, for example, which is smaller for power generation. EMEA would be more focused on oil and gas than Asia Pacific, so it does work both ways. Um, so these are the different dynamics that play into these global numbers. So I've talked a bit about commodity prices increasing. Um, this slide shows commodity prices over, or material prices over the last uh, decade um, in terms of an index. Now I'll focus just on the, the last few years really, where you can see the, the decline in, from around 2014 um, and continued decline in 2015 before prices really stabilised through 2016 and actually started to rebound. Um, now we are expecting that upward tra trajectory uh, towards the end of the, the graph there to continue through 2017 going forwards. That's for materials, that's going to have a positive impact on industry sectors such as metals and mining, so we'd expect increased investment because of the commodity prices there. 
Um, similarly, uh, crude oil prices, um, as I'm sure you're all aware, um, they declined uh, greatly in 2014 uh, and continued to decline through 2015. But then a similar story in that 2016 was the rebound year. Um, prices started to rebound somewhat. Um, Looking forwards, we are expecting um, prices to stabilize uh, through 2017 and going forwards, and then increase uh, from there, as you can see from the graph there. Um, we're expecting prices this year to stabilize around the mid-50s um, per barrel. That's driven primarily by OPEC reducing production, but then also it's going to be driven by um, increased investment in ethane processing capacities that we're seeing. So it is a demand side as well as a, a production side. All right, so that covers the economic section. Um, now to move on to the motor market specifically. Um, so here is some uh, top level information about the industrial motor market. Now, we do individually research the LV motors as well as the MV motors markets individually, uh, but for the purpose of this slide, I wanted to combine those numbers for you. Um, so as you can see from the slide there, the, the figure that's uh, in large font, we're expecting in 2017 around 40 million unit shipments of motors. Um, you can see from the, the map there that Asia Pacific is expected to be the largest region, around 42% of the market there. EMEA and the Americas, uh, more even, uh, EMEA slightly higher at 31% to 27% in the Americas. In terms of the outlook for these markets, uh, Asia is forecast to grow fastest at 3.0% um, CAGR through to 2021. Uh, EMEA in America is much slower at 1.7, 1.6% CAGRs. Um, now, whilst these numbers aren't particularly large, uh, the market's not growing particularly quickly, it's worth pointing out that I did present this slide uh, last year and the outlook was that much more bleak. Um, so these numbers are actually much higher, um, so it's worth pointing out that we are expecting the market to pick up, things are looking better. Now this is a, a quick overview of some of the major suppliers um, for low voltage motors. Um, we've broken this down into a couple of categories. So major players, global players, such as VEG, Siemens, ABB, for example. Uh, and then next tier competitors like Toshiba, GE Industrial, Fuji Electric. Um, I won't re read them all out, they're available there for you to see. Um, but this is an example of some of the players that we're uh, in contact with as part of our research um, and how we see the LV motor market uh, being supplied. So just to review those companies by major region, uh, in the Americas you can see the top three are ABB, VEG and NIDEC. Asia Pacific, it's ABB, Tico and Hyosun. Uh, and then EMEA, it's Siemens, ABB and VEG. Now Siemens, ABB and VEG uh, that are leaders in EMEA, we also see those as the top three globally, uh, just not in that particular order. So some of the key trends that we're seeing then, um, we're seeing um, average selling prices and the, the supply chain to be increasingly crucial. Um, so we are seeing a trend, uh, a drive for increased efficiency of motors, which is driving that trend to IE free motors. Um, and with that, prices are increasing. We're expecting, we expect that prices on average are about 20% higher um, for IE3 motors than IE2, and for each uh, efficiency class, uh, around a 20% jump in pricing. So there's that upward uh, trend to, to prices increasing, but there are uh, some trends countering that. So we're seeing um, prices in each motor efficiency class, we're seeing prices very competitive. Uh, there is a, a downward trend, um, more so as regional players are developing their ability to provide more efficient motors. Um, I've mentioned that the IE3 trend will increase ASPs, um, but another thing that's impacting ASPs is steel prices. We are expecting the price of steel to increase towards the end of this year and continue to increase going forwards. 
Uh, and with that, we're expecting um, motor suppliers to pass those costs on to their customers, again, increasing average selling prices. Now this slide shows the global timeline for regulation that's been introduced around efficiency of motors. Um, so you can see it's quite a busy slide. Um, uh, I don't have time to talk through it all, but just to point out some of the key areas. So the US was the earliest to um, introduce the requirement for IE3 motors in 2011. That became a requirement later on in Europe uh, in 2015. Uh, the requirement for an IE3 motor or an IE2 motor with a variable frequency drive. Um, what we're expecting this to really drive, uh, and this shows the requirement for increased efficiency, and that will essentially uh, phase out IE1 motors. Now, the majority of regions do still allow IE2 motors um, to be sold into the market. Uh, so we are expecting IE2 motors to grow faster than the market average uh, with that tra transition from IE1 to IE2. But there is also a transition forward to IE3 motors as well. But the proposed regulations for IE3 motors, we're not expecting those to restrict growth of IE2 motors, certainly not before 2020. The fastest growing motor efficiency class is actually IE4 motors. Now it is a very niche segment, there, there are not that many uh, compared to some of the other motor efficiency classes installed and sold. Um, however, because it's such a small um, base, it can grow that much faster. Uh, and that's not even driven by any regulation at the moment. Just to illustrate that, um, you can see from the chart on the left there, that shows uh, in terms of units how the, the market for motors broke down by efficiency class. IE1 being the darker blue, IE2 the lighter blue, IE3 the green. Um, that's in 2016, and you can see the comparative forecast uh, for 2021. Now whilst the market in terms of units isn't forecast to grow that much, um, over that period of time unit growth will be around 1.1%. Um, you can see there's a big swing towards IE2 motors with that segment increasing um, substantially and also IE3 uh, with that taken away from IE1 motors. As I mentioned, IE4 is a very small piece. Um, you might not even be able to see it, um, but it is more than doubling over that period of time. Um, whilst it's more than doubling, it still will only represent around 2% of unit shipments in 2021. So that, that previous slide was the market but in terms of unit shipments. This shows the market in terms of revenues uh, broken down by product type. So you can see the list on the, the top left of the screen there, DC brushed motors, brushless motors, um, and the other categories there, stepper motors and traction motors. Now stepper and traction, they represent a very small proportion of the market, combined less than 10% in terms of revenues. Um, DC brush also the percentages next to that. Um, we are seeing a trend from DC brush motors to DC brushless, um, and that's represented by the relative um, CAGR rates on the right-hand side there, uh, 5.4 uh, to 2021 um, expected for brushless motors, uh, and 2.7% for DC brushed motors. Um, using the automotive sector as an example, um, you can see from some of the notes there that we're primarily seeing that trend um, from DC brushed to DC brushless in applications such as power chain um, and airflow applications. But that's not to say there's, um, there's no market at all for DC brushed, um, clearly there is. Um, we're seeing that more, more often in lower cost uh, more reliable applications, for example, power seating uh, and power locks. Okay, so now to review some of the technology changes we're seeing in manufacturing and machinery. Now, I'm sure you've all heard of the Internet of Things, Industry 4.0, smart manufacturing, um, th these kind of concepts. Um, 
and I'll talk you through this process um, shortly. But just as we're on the, the motors market at the moment, um, it's worth mentioning those and, and their impact there. So as motors are, are such a rudimentary, have rudimentary functions at such a fundamental role, um, Industry 4.0 and IoT, uh, the uptake has not been that great as yet. It's been fairly limited. Communication intelligence has typically been done through uh, motor controls as well as end equipment rather than the motor itself. However, we are seeing a growing focus on system analytics. We're seeing a growing focus on optimization. And really, that has increased the value of collecting and using data. Um, so with that, we're seeing um, that there is an aftermarket, for example, uh, with, for motor sensors that's been developed um, with that trend. For example, to monitor, th monitor things like temperature, uh, vibration, the kind of things that could indicate an impending failure. So to talk you through this diagram then, we see the Internet of Things, Industry 4.0, uh, not as a revolution. Uh, we have all the technologies available, um, so it's not revolutionary. It's more of an evolutionary process. Um, so where are we today? Today we have co connectivity, we have intelligence, uh, we have sensors, we have storage um, for equipment. This enables us to connect devices, collect the data. But then where do we need to go from there through this process? The next step is really to be able to access that data that's collected and do something with it. So perform complex analytics, for example, to really get the value from, from what we're collecting. And elements of this, um, you can see below the, the arrows there, um, the use of the cloud, having open interfaces and protocols, um, the concept of big data, and having a set of standards around that to really regulate and standardize. Now the challenge of all these elements really is uh, cybersecurity, um, and it's not a, an easy challenge that's going to be overcome anytime soon. Um, whilst some companies are taking the lead on this, uh, for widespread uptake it is going to take some time. And really we're working towards finding the unique value. So realizing the true potential of having connected society. Uh, where is this all going? Um, until we really overcome the next stage uh, and the key challenge behind that, which is cybersecurity, um, we're not going to get to the neat, unique value. Um, but we do see that as more as a, a speed bump rather than a complete roadblock. Um, we are making progress there. It's not going to completely stop this trend. It's just going to slow it down somewhat. And the unique value um, it's the ideal goal, um, but it's worth saying that it is uh, some years away yet. All right, so I mentioned at the start uh, of the presentation that I'd be reviewing uh, the results of our survey of answering the question, what do machine users want? Um, so most people would say uh, the reason for investing in automation is really to increase productivity. Um, so we ran a survey to really find the answer to what are the, some of the other reasons behind investing in automation. Um, and with that, you can see the results from the survey. Um, there are a range of reasons provided. Um, you can see the list at the bottom there, and there were many more than this. Um, but you can see that it ranged from things like improving product quality, uh, improving energy efficiency, through to improving cyber security. Um, so around a third of respondents selected improving product quality, um, then around a fifth improving flexibility, for example introducing new product lines flexibly and quickly, uh, or adjusting batch sizes, for example. Um, then the, the third most selected response was to improve energy efficiency. So things such as increasing the efficiency of a motor, um, using a variable speed drive, for example, um, those kind of things. You may have noticed that cybersecurity is way down on the list. It's a very small proportion of respondents that selected that one. Um, so that really highlights the challenge uh, that we have for IoT Industry 4.0 at the moment. Um, if it's not uh, at the forefront of people's minds, if it's not a uh, key driver for investing in automation, um, that challenge uh, and, and slowdown for the, the evolution of Industry 4.0 uh, will persist. Um, however, as that trend does pick up, we're expecting that uh, if we did run this survey in some years, that 
uh, cyber security would be uh, much higher than it is now. Okay, so I talked a little bit about productivity being the main reason, and that's why we ran that other survey. Um, it's considered a major reason um, for investing in automation. Uh, it increases output for any given cost or time or both. But to know this, um, you can also consider labor costs. Um, so I'd like to just present some information on um, workforce productivity and its relationship to labor costs. So we see two key factors that play a part of labor costs. Um, one being wage, wages, um, which is probably the more obvious one, but then also productivity. So wages, as I'm sure you all know, can vary considerably by region, by country, even within a particular country, wages do vary. Um, low wages in China and other developing regions um, have driven a trend to outsourcing manufacturing to these lower wage uh, regions. And that's been going on over the past decade or so. Um, but it's also important, important to consider productivity, not just wages. So you can see from the, the chart there, um, we, we've run an index on productivity, uh, and the base is Germany. So Germany is number one, um, and then the UK, US are compared against it, as well as some of the other developing regions we see. So we found that uh, the UK productivity is around 81% of that in Germany. Um, the US is actually more productive, uh, about 15% more productive than Germany. But it's interesting to review some of the more emerging regions where manufacturing is being outsourced to that have these lower wages. Um, you can see China is around 32% as productive as Germany, um, and Mexico even lower at 29, Vietnam just 11%. So really it's worth highlighting here that even though Vietnam has the lowest wages uh, at 1.62 euros per hour, because productivity is so much lower than that of the other regions, it's actually uh, cheaper and labor cost is lower to uh, manufacture in Mexico and China, for example, instead. Now, the, the wages would suggest that there's a huge difference in terms of labor cost, but when you take into account the productivity element as well, you can see that the, the cost of manufacturing is actually closer than you might have realized when just looking at the wages. Okay, so I mentioned that outsourcing to lower cost destination um, it's been a trend for over a decade now. Um, to give you a bit of, um, bit of an example around that, we've seen that between 2001 and 2013, um, the US lost 3.2 million jobs to China alone. Um, and that was felt heavily in electronics as well as computer parts sectors. Now, a trend that we're seeing, interestingly, interestingly now, um, I'm not sure if you can read that green line, um, but it's reshoring. So this is where manufacturers are bringing uh, manufacturing back to home economies and home countries. Uh, now, really what's driving that and enabling that is increasing automation, um, but particularly smart technologies. Um, this is really enabling that reshoring trend. Uh, the aim of that is really to improve technology, continue the pace of that evolution, that development, and keep manufacturing, uh, the manufacturing industry onshore. So the result of this is really that we're seeing lower skilled jobs becoming redundant, essentially. Um, for an example is that robotics could be used um, and they're much more cost effective than, than having human workers. Um, but what it's doing is it's creating these higher skilled jobs. Um, so we are having uh, or seeing that there will be labor shortages emerging because uh, these higher skilled jobs are being created that haven't existed before. So we don't have the, the skills in place, we don't have the talent pool to select from um, to really fill those roles. So this really highlights the need for new skill sets um, for us to succeed uh, and for us to work in this, um, as we see it, factory of the future. 
Okay, so this um, really concludes my presentation. Just to wrap up, um, we are seeing a continued drive to efficiency with motors, as I've touched on earlier. Um, but it's important to note that IET, IOT, sorry, and Industry 4.0, uh, they are really bringing solutions of greater efficiency that, than any niche individual product, such as a motor, could bring alone. For motor suppliers, um, they are still enduring hard times. It is a challenging market, but as I've mentioned, and hopefully as you've seen from some of the growth rates, um, that things are improving. We see some of the best opportunities within uh, construction, commercial HVAC and water, for example. Going forward, uh, there are some notable actions that we do expect. Um, there'll be an increasing focus on providing complete solutions rather than just a niche product, such as a motor. And with that, we're expecting motor suppliers uh, to really have a greater involvement through the complete supply chain uh, to better understand end user needs, not just immediate customer needs. Okay, so that really concludes my presentation. I hope you've all found it interesting and useful today. Um, if you do have any questions for me, my contact details are on screen, and I believe these slides will be made available afterwards. Um, but if anyone has any questions for me right now, um, please feel free to ask. So does anyone have any questions at all? No? Okay. Well, as I said, my contact details are there and the slides will be available, so please feel free to reach out um, at your own convenience. Thank you all very much.